So, so what we generally try to, to address in any meeting of this type is sort of um, how did we get where we are, where are we now, um, and where are we going? So and I am now the presenter. I have power. This is cool. Let's see, uh, I might be, but my down arrow still isn't working. But my space bar perseverates. OK. All right, and as Eric mentioned, uh, about four years ago, we released four and a half now, uh, released our strategic plan that was developed uh, basically as Eric came on. Uh, had, the process had begun, but we um, really sort of put, put it in, into place in that um, in February of 2011. As Eric mentioned, um, this was to go from really from the sequence to clinical applications. This was new for us. The Genome Institute, as you know, started as the Genome Project, which was focused on the structure, the sequence. Um, and we had, had since developed and, and looking into the function of the, of the genome. But this was a, a new thing where we're really trying to apply this in, in health and disease. And as with any technology, we asked ourselves, or any approach, we asked ourselves, well, what do we really want out of this in medical care? Um, and written by these guys. Uh, and, the, and really sort of five things. You want to identify risk. You'd like to prevent disease, improve diagnostics and treatment. And you'd like to increase access, make it available at a reasonable cost uh, to everybody who might benefit from it. Um, you've probably heard us talk about the five domains of genomics research. Um, uh, the structure and function of the genome, as I said, are our bedrock, and they will always continue to be. We are the, the institute that really does that kind of work, and no one else does. Um, understanding the biology of disease is something that we moved into in the genome-wide association era, uh, uh, with looking at uh, associations with diseases and, and other clinical phenotypes. But really what was new in this plan um, was the science of medicine, uh, uh, really trying to get at improved diagnostics, uh, uh, treatment prevention, et cetera, uh, and then uh, improving the effectiveness of, of treatments so that uh, patient outcomes were, were actually in, improved. Uh, and genomic medicine is, is focused on these two areas, uh, as you see here. Uh, Eric mentioned we had a strategic meeting um, actually now about five years ago, almost to the, to the day, um, planning the future of genomics. And at that meeting, those, some of you who were there will remember that the room was kind of divided in, into, into two. There was half of the room was saying, this isn't ready, it's not time, don't you? And we need to learn much more about it before we start using it in people. And the other half were saying, you guys don't understand, this is out there now, it's happening, and you need to get in front of it if you want it to be done right. Um, and so we kind of, kind of picked a hybrid of those and decided to move on in this area. And one of the things that we tried to do was to say, all right, let's take stock and figure out what really is out there. And again, as, as Eric mentioned, much at the, uh, at the urging of Jeff Ginsburg, who was telling us, yes, this is happening out there. Um, we did what we typically do. We, we invited a bunch of really smart people with almost no notice, and in this case, didn't even pay their travel, um, and said, you know, if you'd like to meet us at O'Hara Airport on, on June 29th, we'd love to have you, and we're going to talk about genomic medicine. And about 20 uh, groups came. Um, we, we agreed we would define the landscape and figure out what was common across the groups, uh, particularly try to develop some kind of a nascent roadmap for how groups who were not in this space might try to get there, um, and then identify common infrastructure and research needs. Uh, and that led to uh, a, a, one of the white papers that Howard mentioned, um, and one of the things, uh, among the things that we found there was that there was a lot more than we had anticipated going on. Most of these efforts were in isolation, so they didn't know about each other and they weren't building off of each other. And we also found that, that they had many barriers in common, such as a lack of evidence of promoting um, uh, implementation, um, and that then was leading to a lack of acceptance. There was also, there were challenges, as there still are, in interpreting variants. We, back five years ago, it was, it was comparatively easy compared to what we have now. Um, there was also a lack of expertise in trained uh, clinicians to use this information, lack of standards, and, and difficulty in integrating uh, ele into electronic medical records and clinical workflow. So as you heard, we established a working group of our advisory council. Our advisory council meets three times a year, and, and we have several working groups that uh, provide uh, input on, on specific topics. Um, and you've met the group uh, sitting along the, the, uh, uh, the base of the U there uh, with Eric and uh, um, uh, myself and Laura Rodriguez as the, uh, as the sort of ex officio uh, NHGRI members. Uh, you'll also see all, of, all eight of them as the uh, uh, panel leaders. Uh, and because uh, Eric and I were setting up the meeting, Laura is the ninth panel uh, leader, so, so she'll, she'll get to do that with the ninth panel. Um, the charge for the working group uh, is to assist advising in advising our council and us on research needed to evaluate and implement genomic medicine 
and you can see the charge here, reviewing current progress, identifying gaps. We also try to identify key advances and make those available um, to the public, to the news media when they ask, you know, what have you done for us lately, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, they plan these meetings, uh, this is the eighth, as you can see, um, on timely themes. So we try to identify generally at the, you know, over dinner at the night between the, the two days of the meeting, as we'll be doing tonight, um, uh, what should be done in the future and, and how things are going uh, currently. Uh, we try to facilitate collaboration and coordination and explore models for um, uh, uh, infrastructure support of, of all of these efforts. Um, we describe these um, uh, efforts on our, uh, on our NHGRI website. You can see here um, we publish the notable accomplishments, um, kind of broken down by a, a series of themes. In collaboration with our Division of Policy Communication and Education, DPCE, um, we uh, uh, also work on some of the policy and education efforts. Uh, Eric mentioned that we had come up with a definition of genomic medicine. There wasn't one at the beginning. There was a lot of debate as to what it was. Our definition is, is purposefully narrow because, as you said, we're a small institute, um, but still um, uh, we, we have one there and it really is, we, you know, what we're talking about is implementation using uh, an individual's um, uh, genomic information in their clinical care. Uh, also, our, our um, uh, policy group uh, has been very active in addressing uh, challenging issues such as reimbursement, uh, dealing with the, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as the Food and Drug Administration in some um, of the, the challenging issues related to next generation sequencing. They've recently published, for example, um, or posted a, a, um, a guide to investigators for applying for investigational drug exemptions, IDEs, from the, from the FDA. Um, and our genomic healthcare branch has happily taken over the uh, Intersociety Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics, or ISCC, uh, a very um, um, large and robust uh, uh, education effort um, that, that grew out of these meetings. So um, after the first meeting, we had a second in uh, December of 2011 to promote collaborations, a third looking at various stakeholders, uh, policy and otherwise, uh, mainly reimbursement actually in uh, laboratories. Uh, physician education in January of 2013, uh, we brought together federal agencies in May of 2013 um, and global leaders in uh, January of 2014, where we met some of our colleagues from, from uh, outside the borders. Um, and, uh, and you'll notice that these were happening every six months. This was, it was got to be exhausting for us and it was killing our budget with all of the things that were going on. So we, we slowed down a little bit to every nine months. Uh, we had one on genomic clinical decision support uh, back in October um, and another, uh, obviously this one now. Um, all of these meetings, except for the first, are, are webcast and streamed. They're video archived. They're all on our website. All of the slides are available as well, uh, as well as meeting summaries. And some of them actually then produce um, uh, subsequent white papers. But, uh, but we, we've found and have heard that this uh, is, is something that really is a, is a useful resource to those trying to implement genomic medicine. Just to kind of look at some of the outgrowths of our, of our meetings, um, this, is, this kind of reminds me of a plenarian, but, uh, but at any rate, looking at, at this little fellow, um, when, when he or she was, I don't know if they have, well, we won't go into that. At any rate, um, <laughs> when, when it was small, um, uh, with our, our first meeting, we then went, led directly into what we call the Clin Action Meeting, trying to identify actionable variants, which was something that all of these groups had been trying to do sort of in isolation. Uh, that led directly to our clinical genome uh, resource that you'll be hearing a lot more about today. It also led uh, to the addition of a pharmacogenetic sequencing array uh, in a collaboration with the National Institute on Gen General Medical Sciences, NIGMS's pharmacogenomics research network, um, and taking their array and applying it in, in the eMERGE network in 9,000 people, which has been a, a very fruitful collaboration. Our second meeting led directly to the IGNITE program, um, our, our demonstration projects that where we're trying to bring genomics into uh, a wider uh, array, more diverse settings, and more diverse populations. Uh, our third meeting uh, led to a, a, a sub-meeting with a, a group of payers. We're still uh, pursuing those interactions, and, and they have uh, um, uh, borne some fruit. The fourth meeting on education led directly to the Inner Society Coordinating Committee, which has really taken on a life of its own and now is under the leadership of Bob Wilden. Um, our fifth meeting actually led to a number of collaborations. This was the federal stakeholders uh, meeting. Um, I've, I've put these in dotted lines not to imply that we were responsible for CMS, FDA, or the Air Force. Um, so we didn't, we didn't produce those, but we did uh, uh, develop some, some very good collaborations with them that are continuing. Uh, we did, however, come up with a, a trans-NIH working group on clinical applications of genomics, and we have several members of, of uh, that, Barb Connolly, um, uh, Cashel, Dina, and, and Wendy, and others uh, here at this meeting, and we, we thank you for being there. I understand several more are, are listening uh, to the webcast. 
Um, the sixth meeting on global leaders led to a global genomic medicine collaborative. Uh, we held this, the, the sixth meeting in collaboration with the uh, Institute of Medicine, uh, and they have then uh, taken on the, the support and, and uh, um, um, management of the G2MC, which is kind of an implementation arm for genomic medicine globally, trying to understand what's working um, in, in different kinds of settings and what might be transportable to, to other groups. Um, and that group then is, is related to the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health meetings that, that are happening uh, later this week that some of you are flying off to this evening, and our apologies for making you extend your, your travel uh, um, uh, time away from home. But at any rate, um, so, so we, we recognize that uh, those are, are close collaborations that need to be um, facilitated. And the G2MC actually uh, led to a, a meeting on research directions in Stevens-Johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrolysis, or SGS10, uh, that was held just a few months ago um, because we, we wanted to take sort of an interesting model that we saw in Southeast Asia and see how it might be applied elsewhere. One of the things we found was that there's almost nothing uh, being supported in research in this area at, at the NIH, and yet it is a, a, a paradigm of uh, genomically mediated uh, adverse drug reactions that, uh, that might be preventable. So, so all of those outgrowths, um, the seventh meeting um, on uh, genomic clinical decision support has led to stronger collaborations with the uh, Institute of Medicine's Genomic Roundtable, uh, particularly in, in implementing uh, CDS. And here we are today. So, so as Eric said, there's been a lot to come out of these meetings, and many of them have been uh, really tangible product, products, projects that you'll be hearing about uh, today. So that's kind of the how do we get here. I'm a big fan of Gary Larson, so we're entering the middle of nowhere. Well, this is just going from bad to worse. Um, actually, we're not going from bad to worse. We're in a, in a uh, really exciting time for uh, genomics and genomic medicine. This is a list of all of the programs that we consider to be sort of the focus program. We sent out uh, descriptions of all of these because one of the things we didn't want to do was to, to just have a parade of people coming up describing the program and, and sitting down. We thought we could do all of that. Um, kind of in advance, and so, so, and I won't do that now because somebody took most of my time, but I won't go into that either. Uh, but at, <laughs> at any rate, um, just to just to describe or show them to you in a in a list. Uh, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, I should, I should mention, is a program of the Common Fund of NIH, so it's supported by all of NIH, is building on our Undiagnosed Diseases Network uh, uh, program, sorry, that began as a collaboration between um, the, uh, the NHGRI's um, um, uh, intramural program and uh, the Office of Rare Diseases Research. Uh, we still have a large footprint in that, and we're, we're managing a large part of it, uh, so, and, and it's obviously clearly related to the kinds of things that, uh, that we're talking about today. Um, then there's the NSITE program in newborn sequencing, clinical sequencing exploratory research, um, uh, looking at integrating genomic sequence in a variety of different programs. Uh, the second Emerge 2000. 11 to 2014 uh, actually began right at the right on the cusp of our publishing the strategic plan and and having that first colloquium and one of the things we were able to do was kind of get them to take a little bit of a right turn and say uh, not only are we continuing the biorepository and electronic medical uh, record research that, that we've been doing in emerge one um, but we're, we're really now trying to, to have some small implementation projects uh, to learn a little bit better how to do this on a, on a more system-wide level um, as I mentioned, we, we implemented the Emerge PGX project. Uh, Emerge 3, so Emerge is in an awkward phase right now. It's right at that stage of renewal. Um, and we, we anticipate uh, awards for Emerge 3 uh, being made later this summer. But the plan there is really to identify rare variants in 25,000 patients to determine their penetrance and action ability based on some of the experience that we've had with the Emerge PGX. Um, the IGNITE project um, is, is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, really trying to disseminate this model beyond specialized centers into, into less um, uh, specialized uh, uh, clinical settings. And then the clinical genomics, uh, clinical genome research to uh, develop consensus information on variants relevant for clinical care. So, Howard, I have 910, is that, is that right? Yeah, yikes. Okay. Um, so maybe to give you an overview of how this looks, we're looking at, at kind of looking at two axes from the depth of parent patient characterization going from perhaps not too deep down to the, uh, the bottom of the, of the uh, um, y-axis in, in very uh, uh, deep and careful characterization uh, and breadth of implementation along the x-axis. 
And if you consider this, then the UDN is probably an example of one that is very, very deep. Patients are, are typically brought in for a week of uh, clinical characterization, and, and that's uh, something that we can't do on a, on a large scale, obviously. Insight is, is uh, similarly very deep in some of the programs in particular, uh, and the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Program, a little bit more um, uh, broader, looking at uh, uh, system uh, issues or hospital issues, as well as uh, dealing with individual patients. Um, and also, all of these are sort of testing multiple models where we're really trying to do, see what works and, and what can be uh, codified. Uh, Emerge, on the other hand, uh, uh, tends to be a little bit more unified, particularly in its, in its uh, third phase. It will be um, uh, much more of an uh, approach on a system-wide basis and Ignite, uh, again, um, uh, trying to deal with these things on a, on a system-wide basis uh, for evidence generation as well as impact um, in dealing with institutions and clinicians. Um, so, those of you with a seizure disorder, please look away. I'm just going to flip right past all of these uh, slides describing these programs because I'm a little bit out of time. Um, one thing I did want to sort of pause on was the fact that, that having done some sequencing now from the experience that we've gained from, from multiple programs, uh, we recognize one of the biggest challenges for institutions is, is really what do you do when you find these abnormalities, what, or when you find sequence variation and you may not know what to do with it, how do you report that back to patients, how do you deal with clinicians? This is something that has been studied, actually it, it began in the GWAS era when we started finding to our surprise, people with Kleinfelter's uh, um, uh, syndrome that was undiagnosed, or Turner's syndrome, uh, sort of first detected in the, in the sex chromosomes because those we could be really, really sure of. And the other things we were seeing, we thought, well, maybe those are just artifacts. But boy, those sex chromosome differences, they were, they were sort of incontrovertible. And uh, you know, some of you were involved in those early discussions of what do we report back, et cetera. In Emerge, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, more so than in, in many of the kind of classic uh, genome-wide association studies because many of these centers had an interaction uh, with the patients. They were, they were dealing with them directly and so um, uh, trying to figure out how best to, to do this. Um, and we're recognizing now that as sequencing uh, generates all of these findings, uh, institutions are going to have to learn um, what to do with it and, and we're going to have to learn what the, the implications are. Again, kind of flipping through, my apologies to all these programs that are lovely. We'll put these slides on the, on the website so that you can see them, the clinical genome resource again. Okay. Sorry. Okay, and we'll get we'll get to putting the pieces together. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons from the from the uh, genome project. Uh, I think I found a corner piece uh, here with the three billion pieces. And so um, so kind of looking overall, you have two matrices in your in your materials. We sent out a revised uh, objectives matrix uh, just this morning. Um, that was because I, I forgot to include the Air Force program. I'm so sorry, Ruth. Um, but we, we have it uh, incorporated now. But what I tried to do was to, was to look at the, the focus program, sort of the, the um, uh, six main ones that we have in, in uh, NHGRI, uh, and, and kind of um, um, boil down some of the, the major topics there. So this gives you a feel for the programs that are working in genomic diagnosis, recognizing that these are probably working in that area as well, but it's not really an emphasis. Um, LC issues related to sequencing, we have several programs addressing that, integrating sequencing in the clinic, um, clinician patient education, et cetera. Uh, and this is kind of how we think about these. All of these are just about all, and probably there should be a, a positive uh, a plus sign here, are trying to, to deal with defining and sharing implementation processes. I should note that um, uh, we have the, the slides networked and you all received a WebEx link or a GoToMeeting link in your email. Um, because this is a big room and we have lots of slides in that, uh, I would encourage you if, you, if you're as myopic as I am, um, to, to go ahead and log into the WebEx so that you can see the, the slides on your screen. I think that will make it much easier as we, we walk through the day. Um, so. So, uh, the, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about how we got here, um, we've heard where we are now, and really the golden question is where are we going? And, and that's what we're relying on you uh, to tell us in the next day and a half. Um, and this is going to perseverate again. So uh, you'll see uh, from the agenda, we set it up as nine panels. Um, we do have a panel table here, but I think in talking with the GMWG members, uh, our feeling was that this kind of puts them off in you know, Switzerland or something, and, and we'd, we'd rather have, uh, have more of a discussion around the table. Um, so, so we'll probably do most of the discussion from, from our seats. But at any rate, these were the nine topics we settled on. There are others that could have, have been addressed. You'll notice that health economics is not on here. There are a number of others that are not on here. But, but these are the nine that we went with. <coughs> Excuse me. We asked each of the, the panel leaders, who are the GMWG members, 
um, and their panels to address the importance and impact of the topic, what current programs are uh, addressing it, what gap areas there are, uh, what potential synergies, and what training opportunities and needs there might be. So you'll be hearing that through the day. Um, we've asked for uh, each of the groups to limit their presentations to 20 minutes, um, and I have these really obnoxious signs that I hold up that say you've got five minutes or two minutes or one minute left, um, so we will try to hold you to that. Um, and then we'd like to leave half an hour for discussion uh, and really a robust discussion. Again, a little bit difficult in a big room like this, um, but we're asking the, the panel leaders to moderate that. And, and you, know, you can moderate it from here, you can wander around, you can, you can do it from your seats, whatever feels, feels uh, best to you. Then at the end of that, the last five or ten minutes, we'll ask the panel moderators or whomever they have, they have delegated to do this um, to, uh, to uh, show a, a summary of the key points. Um, and of course, we'll be you know putting these these together. Uh, and if, at the end of of the meeting, um, Howard and I have some summation uh, uh, efforts, and and we may, um, depending on our, our discussion tonight, we may try to write this up as a as a, a white paper for publication. Um, so many thanks. I'd like to express uh, particularly to Rita Chambers and Pagey um, back in the Virginia Bruce, uh, to at least two back here. Thank you so much. They've, they've been responding to my emails all weekend, and I really appreciate that. Um, and also Jackie Ogis and Ellie, who are, are uh, going to be our note takers uh, for the summary of the meeting, um, and uh, really uh, wonderful efforts by, by everyone there. Um, the, uh, uh, particularly our program investigators and participants who, who are doing all of the work that you saw sort of fly by there that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, and uh, the, the many uh, NHGRI staff that are involved in this effort, especially the, uh, also the GMWG. Uh, Pearl O'Rourke, I should mention, is an emeritus member of GMWG. She, she actually managed to escape. Um, but don't any of you get the idea that that's going to be possible? For you, this is the Hotel California. Um, so, and then, uh, and particularly also our, our genomic medicine meeting participants um, on the on the web as well as in the room. Um, so, I think with that, I will stop, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for Terry? <laughs> we'll transition over to uh, Jeff. Is almost up there. Yeah. So Jeff, are you ready? You are ready. 